Hello, Twitter, YouTube, and whoever else happens to come by here. Uh, this is Eric with another episode of Coffee Books Repeat. And today I am joined by a host of authors. Hello, Twitter, YouTube. And I'm sorry, my video is playing over on YouTube, so you can get to hear me twice. Normally, I make sure that doesn't happen. But, oh well. <laughs> here we are. And anyway, uh, you can... Comment over on YouTube. Just search Coffee Books Repeat. You'll come to it. Or you can find me at Gingerman Editorial on Twitter. I posted the link, so it'll still be up there. Uh, so you can come ask questions of the panel of authors here. Because we're going to be talking about the concept of the author's intent when he writes a story. Does it matter? Should we care? Should we try to figure it out? Um, what about when the author says, no, this is what I meant over here. Uh, should we pay any attention to that whatsoever? And to help us uh, sort through this is a uh, bunch of people who have been on the show previously. We have got uh, Brian at, at Darth Chair on Twitter over there. Hey. Uh, also, uh, one of the contributors to the Grey Rooms, a horror anthology podcast, which uh, it, it's live now, right, Brian? Well, November 30th will be the first episode, but we have two preseason episodes out now. One just came out last Friday. Well, this Friday, so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. And we'll probably come back to that by the time we're all done. And we have uh, we have Aowen, at Aowen the Fair, on, uh, on Twitter. And... Uh, she was just on the last episode, actually, discussing her book and their querying process and pitch wars and all of that fun stuff. And, I, and how's how's that going so far? Uh, I found some more stuff that I need to to edit in my book and to tweak some more things. I had a good friend uh, uh, message me back, and to, so I got some more tweaking to do. But I'm waiting for pitch wars to kind of be over, see if I get picked before they don't want you to query while they're doing their stuff. Which not sure how I feel about that, but yeah. So it's kind of on hold, sort of. All right, all right. So, but on hold ish. Yeah, yeah. I'm still working. I can still like edit and then like, oh yeah, I need to clarify that. So that's kind of what all I'm right. doing while I'm waiting. Okay. Yeah. And as Tom Petty knows, waiting is the hardest part. So, <laughs> uh, and of course we have uh, we have Sam Baker, also known hey. as at Sam Baker writes on the Twitter. Author of that freaking doorstop behind her variant variant wars. <laughs> variant wars. <laughs> uh, Sam, for anyone who hasn't seen, you've got to show the girth of this thing. Oh, it's massive. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> because because in this day and age, we don't have paper shortages. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that could be one book. Yes. Well, it. Now, this is very early on in the process, but I am actually considering publishing separate volumes of it also. So that's something that's probably going to come in the future. But for right now, that... it exists in this big, massive behemoth. So <laughs> I like it. I like big books and I cannot lie. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> just, there was no way you were going to pass that up. Okay, so Sam, we, uh, we'll just go ahead and start with you. Okay. So, our authorial intent. Now, let's let's take this angle first. Do you do you spend any time trying to figure out what the author's intent is when writing a story <laughs> at all? Um, yeah, so I think I talked about this a little bit before earlier, but normally if I'm just reading just for pleasure, I'll probably like I try to just read the story without knowing anything about the author because mm -hmm. I don't want to be influenced by their personal beliefs. Um, <clears throat> so I really try to just consider what's going on in the story without knowing any of their personal beliefs. Um, mm -hmm. If I am studying it, so right now I'm an English student, so if I am studying something, it becomes a lot more important to consider authorial intent um, so that's when I would bring in more information about their life and just more context about, you know, possibly what they were intending or just the, the time in which they wrote that. So I'm, I'm kind of mixed on it right now. Okay. So you kind of mentioned something. And actually, Brian, I'm going to throw this one to you. Uh, Sam mentioned about uh, what was going on at the time that the author wrote it. Um, that brings to mind, instantly brings to mind some things like uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. And people these days, you know, they look at 
Tarzan and John Carter and everything and go and you'll start screaming racist and, and because of certain words he uses, certain you know, stereotypes that he uses in his stories that were common at the time. Now, how do you think that should influence how we read a story, like the author's not just the time period, but the author's experiences? I think that we really should read a story. I mean, once you release a story out into the public, mm -hmm. that piece of art becomes the world's art. It doesn't, you know, it's no longer your story in the sense that I can't go years later and say, well, actually, this is what I meant. You can. I mean, if you're still alive at the time when people are reading it. Right. But I think in this case, when you deal with situations like racism, when you deal with situations where a way of life is no longer in existence, mm -hmm. I guess some people would debate that. But the thing is, right. is that um, what do you do? I mean, it's all, that is going to be something that's going to be a concern of any reader. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that you should be reading the text as it is the text. I don't think you should be necessarily saying, okay, well, I don't really enjoy um, what I'm reading about with um, John Carter of Mars or mm -hmm. any of these others. I mean, I, I think that this is kind of strange how you have this, you know, white man who just kind of dictates, he's the Superman of this entire planet of Mars and all these native people that are running around and, you know, it's kind of showing off and, being all crazy um tarzan the same way we were talking a little bit about uh, lovecraft and how okay. a lot of people are aware that he was racist and some people have that tendency to look at his his books now and say oh i don't want to read this racist trash okay i mean that's a fair enough point but would you have read and enjoyed his work without knowing that and that's kind of the curious thing that I have. Maybe in some works, the author, his intentions, I guess, are very clear. Oh, this person. But you can't really say that because even if you say, well, the narrator is, is suggesting all this, he's telling me the story. The narrator in itself is a different character in this book. It's not the author. Mm -hmm. So that that's true. That's true. You know, that's often is the case where the narrator is himself. Um, you, uh, well, as you, as you said it very well, a uh, character in the story. Yeah. And even if the writer would say, let's say you have Mark Twain and mm -hmm. he's writing Huckleberry Finn. Um, and which some people are having issues with that now and, you know, kind oh, of changing yes. the story and banning the books and everything. For the, for the record, this is nothing new. Uh, right. This, the, that debate was going on back when I was in elementary school. Oh, yeah. I recall the I recall the teacher saying something about back it. Back in the dark ages. <laughs> back in the dark ages, before <laughs> the, dark the ages, I kid you not, before everybody had the internet. Well, yeah, I, I remember it, those times. I know when when cordless when cordless phones were a novelty and that only the rich people had. Right. But let's say Mark, you know, Mark Twain says, you know, he uses himself as a narrator for this story. Mm -hmm. And he knew this kid named Huckleberry Finn and they're, you know, going on their little right. adventures. Even that Mark Twain as the narrator would be sort of an alternate Mark Twain mm -hmm. because this is still not facts. It's still fiction. Mm -hmm. So no matter how you look at it, whoever's telling you the story is not the author. And it is that's why I personally look at the intent as it's interesting to know the history and maybe why the author wrote something that he wrote. Mm -hmm. But if, if I'm just going to focus on the story for enjoyment, because I want to read it, I'm not going to look at certain things like the background, or I'm not going to look at, you know, maybe who the author was, what his intentions were, because everything else should just be kind of a standalone thing in existence right. as opposed to the, what, I think also what the text is. Yeah. sometimes you're looking for something too. So like you mentioned Mark Twain, um, you know, the stories, a lot of them, the, the point of the story in a lot of ways is that racism and things like that aren't good. But mm -hmm. the way that it's written, 
is the way that they spoke in the time. So if you're reading for enjoyment, you may not care what it was, but if you are sensitive to finding those things, you might see something that you think is racist, but if you don't know the author's intent and the time in which he wrote, that can be a problem too. Um, one thing that comes to mind for me is um, JK Rowling with Dumbledore being gay. So maybe this is something that she had in her mind the whole time. Like I have a character who's left-handed. You probably won't catch that pretty well in my book, but he's left-handed, okay? And um, so, uh, you know, maybe she had this in her mind the whole time. And you would, reading that, if I had not, like I didn't read uh, Harry Potter until I was an adult. And then mm -hmm. if I had not heard all the kerfluffle about, ah, oh, Dumbledore's gay and all this stuff, I probably wouldn't have caught on to it. I would not have, nothing would have made me go, oh yeah, he's gay. But, you know, she mentions, oh, okay, I could see maybe she really had that in mind all along, or maybe she's adding it in because people wanted it. Um, but all we have after the fact is either the, the author's explanation or what's in the book. So if you're looking for it, you might think it's there. Um, mm -hmm. But if it's not explicitly stated and you're not looking for it, you might not care. You might not know it's there. Mm -hmm. That actually uh, brings up kind of one of the bigger issues with uh, when an author decides to chime in and say, no, this is what I meant. Uh, the author winds up telling you what to think, which I'm, I'm going to actually say, as far as I'm concerned, the author has every right to do, after all. It's while Brian Brian's point about once you've released a story, it's kind of you know, it belongs to whoever reads it. It's still also your creation. And if you want to say this is what it means, well then by golly, fine. And then I can judge you on whether or not you were successful in conveying that meaning or not. You know, what? this is what you wanted it to say. Did it or did it not? I don't know. But I also don't like. I don't necessarily like being told what to think about a story. That's why one of my favorite directors is Christopher Nolan. He comes up with these very uh, in-depth, very in, very intense stories, uh, deep plots, lots of twists. And at the end of the movie, you don't necessarily know what to think about it. He doesn't tell you, it was like, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Do you really know what happened to the story? You actually don't. You got you. It leaves a lot for your mind to play with. And I actually, Appreciate that. And he never talks about the meaning of this stuff in interviews. If you're not sure what happened at the end, he's not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, yeah, have, I, think, I have no doubt he knows. <laughs> I think with you can also have, and this is like what I enjoy seeing in stories the most, is there can be some sort of authorial intent there, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily like forced. Um, mm -hmm. Like one of the best examples I can think of is when Metamorph the Metamorphosis um, was published first by, uh, well, actually, I think it was the original version that wasn't translated. Um, but anyway, when that was first published, Kafka was like, I don't want a picture of the bug on the cover. I, I don't want people to actually consider what's happening in the story as the physical manifestation because he wanted people to be able to use that sort of monster to represent other things in their life that could be tearing their family apart. So along with that, I mean, there was that authorial intent. And I think even, even if there is a picture of the cockroach on the cover, people can still see that monster and be able to realize that it's not necessarily just the physical manifestation of it. It, it can also represent other things in your life. So I think... I think it's good if you have intent and you do it in a way to where people you, you're giving people the tools to really do what they will with it. And as long mm -hmm. as you you know that that not everyone is going to interpret it the same way, they have a lot of freedom to, you know, use your intent for really for their best reading experience. Yeah. And I think that gets to kind of the fundamental way, the, the the basic way that I look at it. If an author has a particular meaning in mind, well then okay, fine. Then that's what it then that's what it means. But there can also be other unintended meanings that the author didn't see, you know, didn't see coming at all. That actually a careful reader or or viewer in the case of film will pick out over time. Um you know like um but kind of getting back to uh, the idea of trying to go, trying to look at the author and go 
from whatever he, whatever the author he or she may know about a certain thing and trying to go meanings, pull meanings from that. Aon, I'm going to throw this one to you uh, because, well, frankly, because of your name. <laughs> uh, and everybody looks at the Rohirrim in Lord of the Rings and goes, Anglo Saxons! Basically. And, th and that explains, um, oh my gosh, why is my Alexa alive? <laughs> <laughs> Kill it! Kill it now! I think it, I think it heard me yelling and thought I was yelling at her. Dangerous <laughs> AI. <laughs> uh, anyway, what was um, you, I, I wasn't quite sure what your question was. Your your. Uh, my, my 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 question was, um, well, I guess when there are clear parallels, because let's face it, there are parallels between the Anglo Saxons and the Rohirrim, mm -hmm. but it doesn't explain the Rohirrim necessarily. I guess how lens. far how far would you draw that? Well, I would say I mean like it's a lens through which we can see something, mm -hmm. and knowing that Tolkien was a linguist, so that's that comes back to knowing a little bit about his culture. Knowing that he was a linguist and he wanted to create a world that was distinctly um, English folklore, he would have based it on English things. So my imagination is that. Um, the Rohirrim are definitely Anglo-Saxon because of the language and because of the runes. Um, and so like with my name, all the different, the different, even the letters, the runic letters have individual ne names. Mm -hmm. So like the W, uh, I think, I think it's the W in my name means horse and the end in my name means joy. And that's part of what my name means. And so he legitimately based the language and the runes off of Anglo-Saxon runes. Um, but I think also he tried to make it nebulous enough. This is kind of something that I, I like in my story too, is trying to make it a little bit nebulous so that it's not pinpointable in one period of time because um, Gondor, I think, is definitely farther advanced as far as time period. So I would put um, probably Rohan was probably around 900 years, 900s, but I'd imagine that Gondor is a little bit later, maybe 12 or 13. Uh, and then, you know just the different time periods. So I think it's kind of a lens too, because you know, like you can't pin it, always pin it down. I'm not sure if that okay. quite answers what you were looking for. No, it, 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 it does. It does because yes, I, I think that's very fair because there are enough parallels. It was like, well, obviously you were drawing off of Anglo-Saxons, but he also, if, if you read his letters, he re, he very much argues against that. Well, I don't. Uh, I haven't actually read all of them yet. I know yeah. Shang Chi, but what does he sp say specifically regarding the Rohirrim? Yeah, he, ba he basically says no. <laughs> they're they're not they're not Anglo Saxons. <laughs> That's but you no. Know, I question that though. I mean, like as well, you should. You can't ultimately say okay, the author's wrong. Um, maybe he's hiding for some reason. But when the language is based off of Anglo Saxon and a lot of the culture and the runes and all the things and all the names are pretty mm -hmm. much Anglo Saxon, um, you have to wonder okay, maybe they're not meant to be Anglo Saxons, but they're definitely based off of them at some point. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's exactly right. And his one of his big things was he didn't want people, he didn't want people to look at his own experience, his own knowledge, his own field, and just use that to can easily explain away a story or just to state that, well, he really liked Anglo-Saxons, therefore they'll hear more Anglo-Saxons, and like, as though that's some sort of explanation. <laughs> that That's the thing that he was mostly concerned with when it came to people doing that. He didn't want people to take his... He, didn't, he specifically didn't want people to take his knowledge and his experience and read that into the story. He actually was very much, uh, I think it's fair to say, Brian's view of, no, this is my story. This is my text. You read it as it is. You don't get to, you don't get to use my life to interpret it. That's what, that's very much where he was. Well, there was, the most part. there was that, um, I don't know a lot about it. So maybe I'm entirely wrong here, but I always remembered there being the story where C.S. Lewis and Tolkien were really good drinking buddies mm -hmm. and they were very religious in their mm -hmm. own way. But oh, yes. I guess they had some kind of dispute because C.S. Lewis felt that it was OK to make Christian ties, religious ties into his universe, whereas Tolkien said, whoa, whoa, that's too much. You know, yeah, you have to like back out. 
Yeah, it's not so much the ties, it's, it's allegory. Okay, yeah. Although, then you look at Gandalf the White and Jesus, and you kind of say, well, wait a minute here. But Well, there's a big difference know. between... Um, th th this, this, is, uh, this is something, actually, that's important to understanding uh, what we mean, what Tolkien means by all of that. We use allegory in a much different way than he did. We use allegory today to mean more like analogy. Whereas allegory... The way he would have used it is more like straight up, uh, like one for one comparison. Uh, you know, a uh, uh, popular, well, I don't know how popular it is anymore, but a historically popular example of this that's still in print today is The Pilgrim's Regress by John Bunyan. Uh, go back and read that. And if a character is meant to, is meant to represent faith, that character is literally named Faith. Mm -hmm. okay. This, this huh. is this this that is allegory. That is that is true. Allegory, and that's the kind of thing that Tolkien means. And uh, you said Pilgrim's Regress. Is that a different thing from Pilgrim's Progress? I don't think I've read that one. I, I have not read Pilgrim's Regress. Okay, I haven't read that one either. Okay, yeah, I have, but Regress is actually Lewis. So, okay, <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't read that one. But Bunyan is much, much older. Yeah. <laughs> but. <laughs> One of the things that um, that Lewis, I think, said a lot of times about his his um, stories is that one of the things, like the way that he came to Christianity, is he found uh, his first great love was in Norse mythology, mm -hmm. and then he moved on to loving Wagner, who based a bunch of his stuff off of Norse mythology. He, so, like to him, the fantastic and the mystical and the longing for those other worlds was was um, evidence of longing for a deeper. A deeper place, something beyond ourselves. So you would say that, like, because you're hungry, because there's such a thing as food, you know, and because you have this desire. So he, I think, he was much more into um, including real world things, regardless of whether it was intentional. Because you really, you write what you know. So like, when you write something, and you know, like if I write a piece of music and it's clarinet heavy, because that's my primary instrument, I may not have intentionally done it that way, but somebody else could go, "Hey, she's a clarinet player." So I was thinking about this a minute ago. So like. Hey, she's a clarinet player. So maybe I didn't intentionally go, oh, I want to make it heavy on clarinet music, but I know the range of the clarinet. I know what I like in the clarinet and I know what I prefer. So if I write a piece of music and it's heavy in it that way, um, but the uh, the interpretation of a piece of music has some um, variability, but you can't go so far as to say this chord needs to be minor. This needs to be a different chord. This needs to be a different note. So I think there's a there's kind of a limit there too. Mm -hmm. I went back a couple steps in the conversation. I was holding on to it. No, that's okay. I, I guess I, I was just thinking that that was a good example of almost like a battle between authorial intent, whereas they kind of had a huge disagreement as to how much influence maybe your biography and your interests actually have in your story. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, it, it, actually, that wasn't it. It really was just because um, allegory, he sees it as the author telling the reader what to think about it because you're drawing these clear one-for-one -one comparisons you are saying it's like you are supposed to be thinking about this in this way now he actually calls allegory the purpose domination of the author mm. <laughs> that, that those are that is a direct quote from one of his letters i don't re, i don't recall which one <laughs> but, but yeah so he's not a fan but that go go read like leaf uh, go, go read leaf by niggle and um See if that's entirely accurate. <laughs> Which one? Leaf by Niggle. It's um, it, it's a wonderful short story. Is it in the Tales from the Perilous Realm book? Yeah, I think it is actually. I just bought that one. Haven't recently. Haven't read it yet though. It's on my shelf. Okay, it's a, it's it's long. It's longish for a short story, but it's well worth the read. It's one of my favorite things actually. I actually re just recently uh, wrote a review on it for. Uh, for another website that I work with, uh, Catholic Reads, and uh, did a short review on it. As it's I go, going back and rereading parts of it just to refresh my memory. Oh, so it's it's perfect. <laughs> okay, but uh, enough waxing poetic on my part. Sam, you just had a bunch of classes and everything yeah. that <laughs> dealt with this very a... topic. So yeah, <laughs> in, so enlighten really, us with your it's education. It's really interesting because. Um, like as an author, I I really don't want people to like take my personal beliefs and you know 
keep that in mind when they read my stories. But as an English student, I've had quite a different experience because when, um, especially when you're looking at a text that's older, um, it it almost is kind of necessary to consider the context of when the text was written and who it was written by and what their sort of life was like. And for the most part, like when, when I study a text as a student, um, you have to think about how, just like movies, um, books are sort of a reflection of the culture of when they were written. And not always are certain texts going to have like specific, um, I guess, metaphors based on their culture, but the, it's it's normally rich with different aspects of the culture. And so it's really important to consider, you know, like what sort of a life did the author have? Did they, you know, experience anything in their life that would help us understand this text? And through that, it can help you understand their culture a little better. And so especially if you're reading something that is older, it can be really helpful to understand, you know, where the author is coming from. Mm -hmm. But at the same point, like the the culture in which you interpret a text changes, you know, through through all the years. And so that's why they still teach Shakespeare now, because texts always have different meanings depending on who's interpreting them. So it, it's really, I have mixed feelings about it because it can be nice to know like what the original intent was in the original culture in which it was written mm -hmm. or, you know, the author's personal life. But at the same time, it changes every time we interpret it because, you know, every culture can find meaning in specific texts. So I don't know, <laughs> I have mixed feelings on it still. I was talking to my husband about this earlier because I was like, all right, give me some thoughts, help me, help me think. Um, I think it depends upon what you're gonna do with it. So if you're reading something just for enjoyment or inspiration, uh -huh. the context doesn't necessarily always matter if it's just for personal enjoyment. But if you're reading something like a sacred text or historical text that you're gonna base your life off of or that you are going to write a paper about or write some sort of study or proclaim it, then you really need to know what's there because there's things like the language is important. So like there's four or five different words that mean love in Greek. Yeah. And so like if you're looking at, you know, if you're reading a passage in the Bible and they say love and you don't know that there's different kinds, um, you know, you might consider them all the same, but you can look and figure, okay, what does this mean? Or the context of to whom was the passage spoken to? Uh, you see a lot of people who will say, um, well, Jesus said to sell all your stuff. Well, he didn't really say that. He was talking to a specific guy. So you have to know the whole context. He was talking to a particular person. And the intent of the author, the speaker there, Jesus, was to say that stuff shouldn't be your love. Money shouldn't be your love. You know, and he told the specific guy, go sell your stuff because you're not there yet. Um, and so I think a lot of times if we're going to apply something to our life or to the lives of others that we really need to know that author's intent as well as the background, as well mm. as, you know, where, what do the words mean? Were they originally written? All those things like that. I think uh, that gets uh, to something that, that Brian was talking about uh, when we briefly brought up Burroughs and everything. Understanding the culture of the time that the author wrote is important for being able to just broadly speaking uh, get get the get the context of the story. Being able to say, okay, is you know, because we might look at a certain thing and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe so and so said this in this way. But then you know, you read back in the time, it's like, oh, everybody talked like this. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, all right, all right, dial it, dial it back a notch. Whatever you think about the about the time period, this guy is not unique. Uh, and that's just you know that's just one particular, um, relatively crude example that's e easy to bring to mind. But yeah, uh, understanding generally the culture is important for being able to understand what what the characters even mean by what they're doing. And that's why we, as like Sam said, why we keep updating, not not just teaching, but updating Shakespeare in some way. We keep yeah. making a new version of the Tempest and everything uh, because we're trying to take those themes and everything and make them more easily digestible or applicable to our present day time. But if you want to understand the play in and of itself, you actually do also need to understand the culture in which it 
that it came out of. Because otherwise, you're not under, gonna understand that when in oh, I don't remember which one it is, Taming of the Shrew or, or whatever, maybe it's multiples. When somebody goes, I bite my thumb at thee, they, they're flipping them the bird. <laughs> you know, people yeah, are gonna get that. Romeo and Juliet, no, sir, but I do bite my thumb, sir. Do you bite okay? Thank you, yes, yeah, it's Romeo and Juliet, and okay. it's a couple, a couple Italian uh gestures in there, you know. Yeah, or it's like, like I, I, if somebody didn't tell me what that meant, mm -hmm. uh, when it make any sense, you wouldn't, you wouldn't understand what it, yeah. was, what it was. If you problem. if you didn't know that Jews were uh, banned from England at the time, the Merchant of Venice would be a little strange, right. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. A, a perfectly fine example. Uh, now, now, Brian, do you when when you're writing, uh, is is there some sort of is there a point that you hope? A reader gets you by all means you don't have to go to anything specific with a specific piece but uh you know just in general are you hoping the reader gets something in particular out of uh some piece of work i think it would be more important for yeah emotional responses if you write a very you know if you write a scene where two characters and One's on their deathbed and the mm -hmm. other one is facing the effects of, of this as the person who's right. going to live, but is losing their loved one or their best friend, or maybe even murdering the person, you know, you don't know. <laughs> it uh, is a horror series. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but whatever the case is, you would want the reader to feel something from that. I would think right. instead of just reading it as some sort of clinical piece oh, of that doesn't have reaction. In terms of, and I remember, you know, kind of going back into college, we had this professor who enjoyed making the comments, what is your interpretation of the story? And everybody would say it, or poetry for that matter, I guess. It worked the same way, Any anything that's art. And he'd say, well, I wish I could bring back the writer from the dead and bring him in and we'll interview him and ask him what he wanted. And we'll all kind of have the same idea as to what the you know, intentions were. Mm -hmm. But that's not our situation. And it's probably better off that way. If you if I was writing a story and I said, OK, the, it was a cloudy day, you know, you didn't have. But all of a sudden you just the character sees just a few rays of sun kind of breaking through the clouds. Somebody might read that and say, well, you know, this is a person dealing with depression and these the sunlight is breaking through that depression. It's hopeful. He's. He's, you know, starting to recover from whatever has been troubling him. But if the person asked me, I might have said, well, no, I just really like the idea of having a cloudy day and the sun, you know, breaking through the clouds. Right. I mean, really, it doesn't. Their version is better. Right. I mean, in a way, I mean, you know, so. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But that should be the way writing is. That should be the way poetry is. Uh, I remember this one girl was writing a poem that she shared with the class. Uh, about some kind of little mouse that was scurrying in her apartment. And she kept the way I, I don't remember how the poem exactly went, but essentially I had this weird idea. I thought, you know, this sounds like a really creepy ex-boyfriend who is basically not going away. And it's almost like a stalker. You know, you, you kick them out of your life. You don't want them in. You shut the door, you lock the door, you do all these things. But suddenly it finds its way back into your life and it's really creepy. So I was explaining this to everybody in class and everyone's like, he's nuts, you know. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, when we were kind of uh, producing our, our portfolios and getting our grades from the professor or whatever, she actually said, you know, that girl came into me after class and told me that you were exactly right. So it was kind of weird. You could but have you had saw a million it. interpretations. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not saying that mine specifically was right. It was aligned with hers, but that's the point of art. That's what we're doing. We're giving people the freedom to analyze and interpret and process the story any way that they want. And, you know, so that's how I look at it. I, I'm happy if somebody thinks of something a little differently. And sometimes I think, man, I wish I would have thought of that when I was writing it. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. That's what I meant. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. 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 It was totally. It was deliberate. It was deliberate. <laughs> My brother, uh, he likes to rant sometimes about, you know, the concept of the death of the author. Like when the author is dead, you have to interpret the, the book with, you know, what's there, what's already in the pages without, 
I mean, unless you're you're doing something philosophical with it, unless you know that's that's what you what you're trying to do with it, you kind of have to interpret it with what's there. Um, I use the example. Um, I have a character, and then somebody has asked if she's a lesbian, and I said, no, that's not really what I wrote her to be. Um, I just wrote a character. But if it brings somebody joy and they feel better and they see themselves in that character, how about it? Makes you happy, great. However, you couldn't write, uh, you, or you should not write uh, an, an essay on the role of LGBT characters in fiction and include my character because it's not explicitly stated. It's just mm -hmm. an inference. So I think too, we also need to w make sure that we are, if we're inferring something that it's, we're not trying to force the inference on other people. If we're, you know, if we see the ray of sunshine and the clouds outside, that we're taking that personally and we're not saying, you know, this means that you should be happy because the author is trying to make you happy. No, maybe I think it's the ray, maybe it's the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it's headlights of a train, you know, uh, kind of <laughs> you know, maybe something different. Maybe, uh, maybe that's not what I interpret, you know, maybe it's heaven calling me and I'm going to die. Um, but you know, you see, you have to kind of watch what the, your, your intent is with your, your intent with the author's intent. And that is uh, something that d makes this such a complicated and interesting topic. Also, because... Bradley, Billy said Billy's watching. Yep. Yeah, I was actually just gonna get gonna give him a shout out there. He's. Uh, I beat you to he, it. He, he, you did. He uh, pi piped up there on the YouTube. So, Billy, any questions or anyone else who happens to be watching, you can comment over on the YouTube there, and uh, by all means, make a comment, ask a question, whatever. Um, we're all here for a while. <laughs> for a while he's not going to let us go <laughs> you all we can we can talk forever twice right yes <laughs> twice we'll just have like i said we just got to fire up a multiverse machine and get it going i don't i, I, I didn't like just give me a tardis hold on where's my my screwdriver <laughs> of course i don't know does i does the tardis do multiple universes it just doesn't do wood no that's the sonic screwdriver i don't know uh it probably could. I think it should. That would have been a good way uh, to to incorporate the new doctor. That, that, that's that's a conversation. For, that's a conversation for a for a different episode. We're a French podcast. Yes. I need, so, we need the we need the Doctor Who meets Bill and Ted. That's what we need. Oh god. The TARDIS versus the uh, phone booth. That that is <laughs> something I would be up for definitely. <laughs> Uh -oh. One thing I was actually thinking about that uh, kind of goes along yeah. what we were just talking about, about the death of the author. Mm -hmm. um, coming from an author's point of view, this is so interesting because even when an author isn't dead, their interpretation of their own story changes too. And I've had that happen with my stories. Like I'll, I'll have some sort of intent to have some sort of underlying meaning in a story and then when I'm done with it and I read it again and, you know, it seems like every time I read it, I have a new realization about it. And that happens when I read, you know, other people's books. You mm -hmm. know, every time I read it, there's something new about it that makes me think about it differently or makes me feel differently about it. And so even if the author is still alive, you can't really know their true intent because a mm -hmm. lot of times, sure, they probably had an original intent for it, but that's probably changed at that point. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it does uh, it does shift around. I think that's absolutely accurate, and I think that fits in with the whole idea of you're not so much you're not necessarily 100 percent in control of the story. Yeah. The story, uh, I mean, you're filtering the story in a sense. It's almost like it's out there, and you catch it, and it's your job to bring it out to the world. And yeah, your your intent is there, but it's also, in a way, something that came through through you and not just from you. Yeah, I understand a lot more. I think I have a different perspective of when I'm writing things now or when I'm watching movies and I'm mm -hmm. watching a movie or reading a story. I have different perspective. I'm like, oh, I can totally see why they put that in there because uh -huh. you know, just processing through things is different and it helps. I think it helps you understand a lot. Just, I think everybody should try writing something at some point in time because you look at the world differently after that fact, I think. I think that's uh, a excellent prescription. Everyone should try to write a sh at least a short story and work retail. You'll be a better Thank person. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I slight aside, I realized that when I had a brief re experience in retail, I was like, you know what? Everyone should have to do this for like at least six months out of their lives 
work retail or work fast food, something, something where you just have to deal with people all the time. You will I, be a better customer. <laughs> I uh, I worked at the front desk of a music store or yeah, a music store, just, you know, checking receipts, answering questions, answering phones. And we had some very interesting characters. Let me tell you. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, do, that does come in. That's for sure. And that's the guitar players. I'm telling you what. Now I want to uh, th I want to throw out uh, just generally. Do you guys ever read uh, read a story and you're like, that's yeah, you know, wh whatever whatever this given, you know, you get a thought or something from a character. And you're like, that's the author right there. That's the author definitely coming through that character and telling me what he you know what he thinks. Yeah, I actually this this happened to me last term, uh -huh. so I was taking this class. Um, the it, it's like a genre class so we were really talking about like robot stories and there's this play called r-u-r and i i read the prologue before i got into the play and the prologue talks about the author's life and it talked about how um he he wrote in a language that was different than english and so he had to learn like a whole bunch of different languages because i think it was check i can't remember exactly which language he wrote in but it was one that was not very common so he had to learn a whole bunch of different languages so he can translate it into different languages and there's a character in the play like really early on in the play that knows the same amount of languages as him <laughs> so yeah. i was like oh i wonder why he wrote her to to know all these languages you know so yeah i've seen stuff like that and it's interesting knowing the author's story uh to catch those little details mm -hmm. but i feel like it's also it also can be a detriment to like how you interpret it because you might not be able to like see it you know in an unbiased sort of way right you kind of you, you kind of wind up just Okay, the that's clearly the author thinking this about that. So then that becomes a lens through which you see everything if you're not careful. I think you get that too when you have um, when you try to force a moral to a story and it's so overt. Um, mm. And so you'll get that sometimes in um, in some things where where like it's clear that the author spent more time thinking about what they were trying to say, the message they were trying to say, rather than crafting the story. So it was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, yep. Chronicles of Narnia comes to mind. Like, if you if you have any sort of religious background, you understand some of the symbolism that's there. Um, but it doesn't overshadow the story. It's melds of the story. But and sometimes you'll see things where the author, like she was saying, speaks the same number of languages. And maybe he was just trying to be clever and cute and, ha-ha, it's me. Um, but, you know, you you have some bots where you're like, this doesn't quite fit. And this seems a little bit like the author is trying to tell me something and make me think or believe something uh, that they agree with without having to, um, you know, write it into the story in depth. Yeah. yeah. Or, or you have situations like in the dark tower where Stephen King actually writes himself into his stories. So, uh, you know, I, I wonder who did that. Stephen King, you know, <laughs> oh yeah. He always, he always uh, writes himself in his mm -hmm. stories to some degree or another. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's amazing how many of his characters are authors. Yeah, yeah. right. It, it's yeah. amazing how many times you would pop up into his movies too. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know. I've like, never read any Stephen King. That's not really. Yep. Oh my goodness gracious. It's, I don't. I don't think I plan to. I mean, I've heard. I've heard about like you know, twelve-year-old rape scenes and writing. There's the, there, there is that. that. That's enough to turn me away from it. You know, it's in here somewhere. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. That, yeah, yeah. I, that was really a weird. That actually is one that it, I haven't it, read. I'm that a fan of puddles, the bizarre. clown. So I don't, yeah. I don't need my clowns to be. I, I like puddles, so I don't need my clowns to be uh, corrupted. Thanks. Yeah. I do think that the definitive Stephen King one that people might want to read, whether they like horror or not, is is The Stand. Yeah, I do think it is fantastic. The way anybody can mix so many characters and actually have some some weight to them at least in my opinion i think that oh yeah I, really well. I would agree with that um i think that it's just a fantastic read and half of it's more science fiction than than horror anyways and then it gets kind of a weird religious post-apocalyptic kind of oh, yeah. to it. but it's it's not your typical stephen king cujo carry monster you know type thing it is and very different great. than than uh so much of his work honestly anyone 
you should read the stand. It's really genuinely yeah, good. There's my, not my... a single twelve year old getting raped. There's, no, there's, no, there's, there's no twelve year olds getting raped. Some multiples getting raped. No, no, no. 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 Actually, I, no. I'm pretty sure no one gets raped in that book. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm yeah. not such a fan of horror. I just bought a collection of Lovecraft books or uh, short stories. Um, so I'm like, I'm gonna read that. But uh, I'm not. I like suspense. I like pretty much everything except for I'm not a fan of like purely romance and I'm not a fan that much of horror. Um, so it's just, it's not been high on my list. It's not like I'm, I'm jumpy enough as it is, you know, with, with things going on uh, just in life in general. And I read a couple of the creepier Peretti books, Frank Peretti. Uh-huh. And like, those are weird enough for me. I'm like, I'm, I'm good. Um, <laughs> uh, don't don't I, listen to the great rooms that's all i can say i think i think, I think is that pretty too or is that uh stephen king i don't know what's that don't listen to what the oh, great rooms yeah don't listen to our podcast then oh, okay I'll, I'll, <laughs> I, I like mysterious like folklore kind of stuff uh but the couple pretty things that i read were definitely meant to creep you out that was his intent there you know it was definitely meant to be a little disturbing nope i'm good did you read House? Was that one of the ones that you read? No, I read. Um, well, I read This Present Darkness. That one was good, or Piercing the Darkness, or whatever. There's two. I read those. Those were good. But then I read The Oath and Visitation. I think were the two that I read, and they're like the two creepiest ones that he wrote. And I just happened to, to get them somewhere. Somebody gave them to me, and now I know why. Uh, <laughs> how I I don't know. House was pretty creepy. If you if you're not sure, you should read it. But uh, he co-wrote that one. But that was um, I think one of the first books of his that I read, and it it is just insanely creepy. <laughs> yeah, I've, ne- I've never I've never read Peretti to be honest. But there's some other ones that are meant to be children's novels, like The Door and the Dragon's Throat or something. That I've heard are good, uh, so it's not quite the same, like the horror, spiritual horror, or whatever. But I haven't read those yet. I have them. Though. Maybe the Curse was pretty good too. I and I think they actually made a movie um, after that one. I will have to add it to my long, long, long list. I uh, my my list is the shelf behind me. Plus, uh, I'm gonna read. <laughs> I just bought Ann Wheeler's second book, and actually, she was talking about some intense stuff uh, recently. Um, she's just, I think she's just Ann Wheeler on Twitter, but she was talking about how, um, just because the author writes something doesn't mean that they condone it. And Mm -hmm. so she's got, apparently she traumatized some beta reader somewhere. And so she's kind of afraid to send it off to beta readers. I'm like, I've read, I've read Game of Thrones. I've seen Game of Thrones. I think nothing you can write will be more traumatizing than that. I don't think. Um, Mm -hmm. but so she's talking about how, you know, the intent is not to say that these things are good. It's to show that your characters have faults, that your character has to be bad. Like, you can't write a bad character without, you know, being, being right. bad. So yeah. uh, she was, apparently she's gotten a lot of flack for that um, because people are just not, they're just kind of looking into it with a one-sided view, I think. Well, they have, I guess the reader has their own intent. We might have said that but, earlier. Right. But we've been talking about the author's intent. The reader... They have their own sensitivities. If if you write about sexual abuse, for instance, and the reader has a problem because of whatever happened in their background, you know, I mean, they're going to have a problem with probably have a problem with your story or might bring up things. But it's not the author's fault. And yeah. It doesn't reflect poorly on the author because they're. I mean, you know, they always discuss how what we're writing is a lot of times we're writing about the problems in our own time, just Mm -hmm. kind of disguised as fantasy, disguised as science fiction, or maybe disguised as just regular, you know, everyday modern day life situations. Mm -hmm. But we have to be able, as you said, to write about a bad guy and have them do bad things. I mean, that's. I have some pretty nasty teenage girls in my story, man, they're pretty bad. Yeah. If I write a if I write an abuse scene like that, that is no different than somebody watching it on, you know, SVU, let's say. Right. And what makes it okay to nobody's complaining about that because they know those people are gonna get thrown in jail at the end of the story, right? So how do they right. know when they're reading my story that that person's well, they know me, so maybe that I don't know. But <laughs> but the point is is that uh, you know, you would have to go through the end of the story before you can make any judgment. And even then, whether the bad guy wins or the bad guy lose, um, mm-hmm. loses, it's all fiction. It doesn't mean you're right. a freak. 
you know. And then you and, have characters that are like there's all these tropes too. Like you have characters mm -hmm. that are uh, like the rogue with a heart of gold. You know the like. Han Solo characters, where they're not they're not really good guys, but they're not bad guys either, you know? Um, yeah, and then right. your, your intent isn't to say that, well, this guy's kind of a good guy, but he does bad things. It doesn't mean that it's good. You know, you have to, have to as a reader, have to kind of separate that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, um, we're, getting, we're getting close to about an hour here. Um, so, Sam, and well, everyone, everyone can get a chance to answer this one. Have you ever read a book that, and where you knew, like like the author said, this is my intent, and, and you're like, it just pissed you off? <laughs> hmm. I'm trying to think. I mean... Or, or, or didn't read a book because the author said, this is my intent, and you're like, yeah, I'm not into it. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't say like what book it was, uh, but I, I've had a few books where, like... Okay, now I know people have mixed feelings about like trigger warnings in books, but I I did like read this one book where mm -hmm. there was a trigger warning saying like um specifically like here's my intent behind these certain like violent scenes. And mm -hmm. I think just from that I oh. was like I don't know if wow. I want to read it cuz now I'm not going to be able to make my own like unbiased interpretation right. on it. <laughs> um so yeah, I mean I have I have come across situations like that where it's just just that knowledge of knowing what the author's intent was has kind of ruined the book for me. Okay. That's fair enough. Brian, you got any examples of that? Uh, I mean, not really. I, I, I will say, I mean, one thing um, that is, is sort of strange, I think, mm -hmm. is, is social media. Because a long time ago when we were reading books from our favorite authors, we really didn't kind of have that 24-hour surveillance right. of their mindset and what they're interested in. So one thing I was surprised a little bit about was how political and how boisterous Stephen King is on Twitter. You know, yeah, when, I read, quite, on, yes. when yeah. I read on writing, uh, I was like, wow, you know, this is a great writing book and it's very inspirational. And he's almost like that uncle you never had. Right. And, you know, he's really funny. He's telling these great stories. What so, happened to your uncle? Yeah. What happened to my <laughs> uncle? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just getting suspicious here of some of you guys. Yeah. Stephen King <laughs> took care of him in one of his stories, I guess. Um, but uh, the the thing is, is when I joined Twitter, I was like, oh, man, yeah, Stephen King. I got to follow him. This is going to be great. And I was like, oh, my goodness. So at that point, I, I think, I don't know if that's really affected my stories per se, or the stories I've read of his, but it's definitely a shock. And I could see like maybe some people would be very like, oh, I don't can't stand him as a human being. So I don't want to read his stories. Um, right, right. Yeah. I mean, and that's you know. something that um, a lot of people find themselves having to process with authors uh actors so on and so forth like i remember when there was a while there was a little while there when uh nobody wanted to go see a tom cruise movie <laughs> you know because he got he got oh. really out there with the scientology and everything yeah and that's that brings up another point i don't think i've ever read l ron hubbard's any of his novels and i don't think i will because just the whole background well, what with his intent was money because he even said yeah. The best way to become rich is to invent a religion. So, yeah. you know, it's like, all right, well, we see what you did there. Yeah, <laughs> and his wife and them, they, like, broke in. Didn't they break into some kind of, like, um, government, like, facility? And they're trying to get, like, records or something I, out of it? I don't know, but I, I, like, uh, <laughs> I don't live too far away from Scientology Central. And so I know people who've been there uh, and who've been, been in it and, and, you know, spent millions of dollars in it. Um, so I'm like, all right, I he apparently achieved his goal, but, uh, yeah. yeah, he could donate. They should just donate to us instead of Scientology if they That's really want to yeah, give us money. Us. You know, if, yeah, if you've got that much money just sitting in your pocket, um, any one of us, I'm sure could make use of it. <laughs> I know. Very, very good use. I mean, honestly, we all, we all write, so we could probably even make up a religion for you if you really need that. There you so go. <laughs> if you really need a fake religion. We can we we can do this. The Church of Ginger. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was that might be bad. <laughs> that might not be good. 
I, I I'd probably have I'd probably have to go to confession if I if I tried something like that. <laughs> I, uh, I, I kind of I agree with what Brian was saying about like Stephen King, and I try. Um, you know, I try. You, they say you shouldn't meet your idols. You know, you shouldn't go right. and. Look, but I don't know a lot, so I can't think of any particular book that I have read where what the author thought or what their intent was really influenced it for me because the authors that I really look into are, I don't, I don't tend to look a lot into them. Like C.S. Lewis, I look into him and Tolkien. And that's, that's pretty much, that's it for the most right. part I like to look into. Um, but like, so seeing something, you know, you try to separate the art from the artist, you know, and try to give them that chance. But if you see somebody who is very, very bitter or very aggressive and you see them on something and then you think I might, that might not interest me. And then if any of that comes through in their writing, you'll be, quick to pick it up but conversely i really really like uh christopher pauline and he's the guy who wrote aragon and yeah, oh. um and that series and you know some people don't like it or it's juvenile because he was like 15 when he wrote it um and so you know some people don't like it some people think it's not good enough or whatever but when you go and you look at his twitter he is the nicest guy and like he retweets fans, he's retweeted me and he's commented and answered questions. And you can tell from looking at what, what he, he does on his Twitter page that he loves his art, he loves dragons, he loves writing, and he loves his fans. And because of that, I will forever be a diehard Paolini fan, even if his work is not the best thing ever or, you know, whatever. But because I know that his he takes joy in it and his intent is just to bring joy to others. His intent isn't to to preach or share a moral is to share an exciting story that's in his heart and his mind and that will excite other people the way he's excited by it and so i think that can work in your favor too on some levels yeah if you're yeah, a nice, guy, nice guy everybody, everybody wants, wants to be your to friend be your and wants to buy your books and nice like you know? he can tell how much he likes he loves yeah. what he does like he's he's always sharing stuff about dragons or whatever you know and um or uh, Brian Rathbone, he t I haven't read his stuff yet, but he tweets dragon puns constantly. And so like that amuses me and you you get to to like some of what, what the authors do and regardless of what their intent is, you know, that, that can positively impact a person or negatively affect what they think. Right, about. right, depending on exactly where it's coming from and where, and where you line up. I think, I think for me, there's one series that I definitely, um, came across that it's like, okay, I know what the author is doing here because he said as much. I don't want anything to do with it. it would be the golden compass series. Uh, by I think it's Philip Pullman. He specifically said he set out to write an anti Narnia. I'm yeah, like, I, 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 yeah, I no. Nope. <laughs> yeah. I heard that. It's like, yeah, no, nope, I'm just not going to go there at all. Sorry, pal. <laughs> uh, if Philip Pullman. Yeah. I think you got it right. Um, yep. But yeah, I, I saw the movie once and I, it wasn't, um, those issues weren't as overt in the movie. The movie was mm -hmm. kind of cool and rideable polar bears was pretty neat. But yeah, for the same reason. I'll give them that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's cool. For the same reason that, um, that you're saying, you know, it's like, I, I don't want to read something where the intent was to destroy something else that I love or to destroy somebody else's work that was meant to be beautiful or spiritual and you don't have to like it, but I, you know, your when your intent is to, to be against something else that somebody did, I think that can pull things away from you. And yeah, make I think you're also specifically, uh, you're specifically limiting yourself. Mm -hmm. You're specifically saying, I am going to write something that is not this, which means there are certain things you can't be. Yeah. But yeah. on the flip side, if you didn't know, that that was his intent <laughs> would the story really give you that impression that it is anti-narnia and would and you I don't enjoy know. it because i don't know i would probably have to read it yeah. I, I would have to read it to, to evaluate that you might be able to to look past it because um i mean unless the movie as i have a shirt it's like the book the, the book is better you know, the book is always better. So, or always more and obviously more accurate. So, I mean, it, it might be one of those where you could look past it. Um, I figured I would rather waste time watching the movie than reading the book. Um, so because no, I, I, don't, I don't think you could for this book. <laughs> oh, you read it? Like specifically, I read the first one and specifically in the beginning of the book, it takes um, like Bible verses and changes it to where like, I, it's been a long time, but I'm pretty sure in the Bible verse, it makes it to where like, 
the serpent is seen as like the pr protagonist. Um, and so even like from the very beginning, it, it sort of changes oh. those sort of like religious beliefs in the story. Yeah, right. I think a lot about that, uh, you know, I, I'm like, I, I appreciate when people try to kind of play devil's advocate and like look at things from different perspectives. So you've got things like, um, I think Jesus Christ Superstar, the musical was kind of from a different perspective and um or uh well, i just had it in my mind uh screw tape letters is from the opposite perspective it's from the perspective of the demons uh c.s lewis screw tape letters is great um oh, it's fantastic. i actually have an audio version of that uh read by john cleese have you seen there's one with andy circus i screw have i know this exists i have not i don't have it, it yet the most <laughs> terrifying thing that you have ever listened to because you can clearly tell it's andy circus and he's wood, and it's just it is super creepy. So go watch it. It's on YouTube somewhere. Um, but uh, so like I can I can appreciate something if it's written. If I know it's why I try not to look too much into as Sam was saying, try not to look too much into the author before you read them. If I know it's just written from a perspective of what about this? What about the perspective of Judas Iscariot? Uh, you know, what would what would the story be like if he told it? And, you know, just kind of a hypothetical philosophical kind of thing. I can appreciate those um, thought experiments, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't like the things where it's twisting something, not as an experiment, but because it's oppositional. Right. Yeah. What happens when you, uh, take like, when you change gender, like Robin Hood becomes a female? No! <laughs> I, I, think just, honestly, I think it's just lazy. Yeah. Okay, here, I have a big opinion about this, and... The reason why I normally don't like when they do just the gender switch with stories like that is because if you want like a story with a strong female character like that, just write an original story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like, don't don't yeah. change the already great story. Just write another one. Also, Amen. nobody Amen. wants. I'm gonna do the clapping. Nobody wants the sloppy seconds. We don't. <laughs> want, we don't want another Ghostbusters. We don't want you to take Doctor Who, who's been a male for 2,000 years and 60 years in film and 13 characters. We don't want, I mean, I don't, Sam probably doesn't. Like, it makes me so mad. I'm like, why can't we have a good character? Because men and women are not interchangeable uh, in most character sh scenarios. Um, and so, like, if you purposely say, this is a reimagining, what if Sherlock Holmes were a female? Or what if Sherlock Holmes were set in our current time period? That's different than like, well, we just need a female character and mm -hmm. I'm going to make a remake of Ghostbusters and rather than mm -hmm. having it be a sequel or having it, um, there was something else that somebody was changing to be female and I was very upset about it and I can't remember what it was now. But um, yeah, that makes me mad. They did that uh, with Van Helsing too. They just, yeah. they, I think there's a new Netflix series where it's Vanessa Helsing. It's actually a sci-fi series and that that is... Um, that is more of a she's a descendant of oh, okay. yeah she's a descendant of abraham okay with that. and it takes place in the future it's a it's a vampire apocalypse story essentially yeah yeah but i do yeah, like, think that you're right i think that when you have these larger than life characters like king arthur robin hood you know all these people where are the female characters that can stand on their own and, and kick butt and that's not as you said it is laziness people need to invent them Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what it is. You need to create. Um, I but also, and this is a this is a significant tangent from uh, from from what the primary thing of the podcast is. But uh, it's 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 worth stating too. Um, as anyone said, men and women aren't interchangeable. Therefore, a strong female character who can stand on her own is going to be a different kind of character than the mm -hmm. male character who does that. Yeah, you can't just make a female version of Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, you, you can't, you can't just, I, I mean, honestly, you can't, you can't legitimately do that. And they've tried to do that a few times. Uh, most recently uh, with oh, Charlie's Theron in Atomic Blonde, and it didn't come off well from what I understand. Like, I, like just, okay, so I brought this point up in yeah. some, um, I think the intent, if the intent is to write a good character who happens to be female, I think it's great. If the intent yes. is insert a female character that's annoying um mm -hmm. i brought this up with talking to erica because what i'd heard about atomic blonde was it was just the character was pretty uh pretty blank um mm -hmm. and she's she's a lesbian too so you could you know easily insert you know okay this could be a guy instead but apparently there's a twist at the end 
uh-huh. um, which kind of explains some of it. I haven't watched it and I don't like I've seen some of the special effects. We've probably watched some of the same clips uh, of people right. trying to uh, perform some of the the, uh, you know, tiny woman beating up three, three large men, this, you know, all at once. Um, but so I probably won't watch it because of that, but I hear that there is a little bit more to it. So maybe there is. Okay. And I'm Fair saying, enough. Uh, Fair enough. I, I think just for clarification on this tangent, you want to do like a wonder woman character where it's like, she's a freaking, she, she's the daughter of Zeus. And that's why she can, uh, throw down with Superman, go for it. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent. Okay. With that. What if we made wonder man and we just, you know, switch the roles up, you know, <laughs> Well, look well, at Zena, know, Warrior Princess. She stood on her own. I mean, she yeah. was her own character. Yeah. Um, and she stu- she was just as good as Hercules. And, if, you know, I think people liked Zena better in a lot of cases. Oh, they did. So, you know, I mean, there <laughs> you go. She, you, was the better char- right? she was the better character there. Well, so yeah, and then so. Kevin Sorbo kind of had that cheese factor that just, you know, didn't work <laughs> as well. <laughs> But there's yeah, a little, but, there's a little bit of that. I, lo- I love I love Kevin Sorbo, but th- that's a that's a fair point. <laughs> but yeah, I mean Zena, where's we need more Zenas, we need more Carmen San Diego's. I mean, I for crying out loud. Yeah, I mean there's a lot of cool or, people. Or uh Eric mentioned the other day, uh Gargoyles. I was watching through the series uh a while ago, but then we couldn't find the next one, so I kind of like haven't thought about it, but the detective, uh, Lisa, right? Alyssa, yeah. Alyssa, mm-hmm. Alyssa. Oh, he, he um, yeah, he pronounces it Alyssa. Yeah. Okay, so she and like she is a great, she's a good character too. And so there's, you know, even in just a kids' cartoon, you know, she's mm-hmm. the independent detective, blah blah blah, has to take care of her family, and she befriends the guy, and you know, like it's not that difficult. <laughs> At least I don't think it is. Oh no, it, it 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 shouldn't be. I, there's well again. This is a whole different. Th- honestly, this is a whole different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> you could get a lot of uh, viewers if you just have one called, you know, women in fiction. Hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I might get a lot of viewers that I'd wind up upsetting, but <laughs> that's, that's their problem. Fair enough. That's Fair that's enough. whatever's intent it belongs yeah, to. Uh, like I like it. There I like go. it. Very nice. Very well done, sir. <laughs> But okay, uh, I I think I uh, I think I lost the uh, the thread though that we had going before we went down uh, that little rabbit trail. <laughs> as far as um, oh yes, with character, gender, intent. So, well, so, sometimes uh, sometimes authors just they throw their intent out there, and it's like oh well, that kind of ruins things now, it doesn't it? <laughs> it? Takes the mystery out of it. I think it, it helps. Does. It does take the mystery out of it, especially I like, when I like questions and plot twists and stuff. Yes, yes, exa- exactly. And when you can sort of, um, you know, yeah, have a little fun exploring it at the same time. Like I said, um, if an author says, you know, this is what it means, oh, okay. I mean, I guess I may think you didn't do it very well. <laughs> I may think it's like, it's like you know what? Happen. No, this, this can't mean that because this, this, and this, and this, and this. <laughs> You have yeah, to, I feel like if you yeah. have to say this is what it means, you probably didn't write it well enough because that that should be obvious to the mm-hmm. readers. Honest, well, I mean, let's look at a perfect uh, film example of that: uh, the uh, the Batman versus Superman infamous Martha scene. <laughs> <laughs> now, has anyone who's spoke, Sam and I have discussed this to it to an extent, and yeah. I'm I'm actually. Uh, so a, a defender of Batman versus Superman to an to an extent, uh, but I also completely see where what people are getting at when they like that was dumb and like they set it up, but they didn't do it, they didn't set it up great. So yeah, I I, I see your point. <laughs> Aowen's like I had a thought, yeah, but I, I lost it. I, I was like I, I had a you were you were looking for the thought. Is it up on? Is it up there? Where is it? Is it over there? <laughs> no, I had a thought. Um, and. I'll have to think about it for a second. All right. Well, we're, we're I don't. I don't want to distract from Batman vs Superman, um, but I didn't know if you wanted to explore that or not. I guess I was. What is your oh. intent? Tell us your intent. No, I, it is, honestly, it is a good example of okay. The the creators were uh, Snyder was clearly trying to say something, you know, about. Uh, 
the the fact that they both had uh that they had this connection this mm -hmm. mother who happened to share the same name shows a reveals a shared humanity that bruce wayne didn't see in superman before that's what he was clearly going for but it didn't but work <laughs> it didn't work i just want to know who read the screenplay and sudden and didn't have the guts to say dude this sucks i mean that's well the other thing too is I feel like when it's transferred from like a script to actually, you know, it being on the screen, some mm -hmm. of those things can get really missed. And so yeah. that might've been something where they thought, Oh, this is going to work out really well. And it, yeah. it just didn't. You thought it was going to be this real emotional Martha. Yeah. Say that name? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I get exactly. Wait, what? But, what? but maybe that's what they should have did. Maybe they should have read that word in Batman's voice and realized <laughs> how awful this was going to be. Like well, um, that and how <laughs> out of the blue it's going to seem in that yeah. moment. Yeah, he's trying to murder him. Literally <laughs> like... over him with a kryptonite spear. <laughs> and then he hears the word Martha. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm completely, I'm completely reevaluating re my opinion of this. <laughs> they became bros after that moment. Yeah, because it's not like there was, <laughs> like I said, they set it up. Yeah. But they didn't, they set it up by doing a flashback to you know bruce's parents being killed but it wasn't like the way they did it it was just a flashback it wasn't like it was clear that bruce was sitting there contemplating it at all mm -hmm. you know and even then it was like it's a one-off that that he does that you know if maybe his mother had been a frequent topic of conversation throughout the film uh Wait. then <laughs> you know then maybe that would have Maybe that would have come off better. It would have come off less out of the blue. Like I yeah. said, it was I, you know I I realized right away what they were doing, you know why they, you know why they did it. But I was also like, the fact yeah. that I've got to think so hard about this and justify it shows that you didn't do it as well as you could have. Yeah. Also, I feel like I feel like it's generally more known that Superman's mom is named Martha, um, and she's like in the story a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like a lot of people probably even forgot that Batman's mom was named Martha. Yeah. Honestly, that's entirely possible as well. That could be why a lot of people had the instant bad reaction. Because, yeah, they... Yeah, you know, they're like, who? What? Why? Yeah. Why? Why? Are some this? some fanboy's mind was blown that day. Oh, Martha! And everybody else was like, dude, this is terrible. <laughs> One thing I wanted to say, and this is why I was at... Um, I thought it might be a good question to ask is back when we were talking about, you know, works of literature and really mm -hmm. old stories and the intent, you know, you mentioned Burroughs, we've talked about Tolkien. He's been, you know, gone for a while now. We didn't have the internet in those days. We didn't have a lot of ways to mm -hmm. grasp the intention of the author. A lot of the time you might've never seen the author in your life, but you picked right. up their book and you read it. You might've spoken about it in, small circles book clubs things like that but you didn't have a large fan base you didn't have an audience so has the intent of an author sort of changed or grown since with technology the internet social media things like that I yes think so, um because you wouldn't have um you like you wouldn't have the opportunity in a lot of ways to examine and re-examine something in some ways like uh, there's a story where I think it was Bach. He walked like a hundred miles to come go see one symphony because if you wanted to see a work of music, you had to go to the place where it was being played. And um, you know, you you didn't have you didn't have the luxury of being able to examine, re-examine, and uh, control F on your computer. You know, to find <laughs> all those things. And there's there are um, there are composers actually a lot of the Russian composers where they're forced to write music because of all the stuff going on in Russia at the time. But some of them, they say that they put um, little jabs mm -hmm. at the rulers there, musical jabs that mm -hmm. might not have been noticed at the time, but later on we, we can catch them like, you know, a strain of a melody from something else because somebody analyzing it and copying it or playing it 16,000 times, you know, notice it. So I think we, we have much more, um, we have more, accessibility as far as the materials but also to other people and other theories you know i mean like we're sitting here talking about this i could google all right death of the offer author but like golden compass whatever i can find whatever i need to instantly and so right. i think that kind of messes things up sometimes for for better or for worse i don't know 
Certainly. And it also, um, I would say the social media, it puts, it not only gives the author a platform to speak more in a way the author may feel obligated to speak more. Cause for one, it's going to be asked by fans a lot. Like, Hey, what was going on with this? What did, what, what do you mean with this? Is, uh, is, is so-and-so character left-handed, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that sort of thing will, uh, you know, will just naturally happen. And at, at some point, a lot of authors, unless they're really disciplined, are going to be like, are going to start responding or mm -hmm. the, what the, what the, um, what the, what the fans are reading into the story is going to start to influence the author's own interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. True. And I, a lot yeah. of people had problems with um, what is the the second the sequel thing the new Harry Potter book the one that's a play uh, Cursed Child or whatever. Okay. Um, I think that I I read it and I don't. Some fans are upset about it. I'm not 100 percent sure why because I I didn't I didn't grow up memorizing the stories but because what she wrote I think a lot of that was influenced by what fans have said. Mm. And, uh -huh. and I think probably Fantastic Beasts is also. Uh, influence and will be influenced by that, and I think that um, that also probably has changed some of her initial intent. Where, he, like, maybe Dumbledore was gay the whole time. Maybe he's left-handed. I don't know. Um, but you know, maybe he was gay the whole time, or maybe it was something that um, could have been. And fans asked about it, and now it's a plot line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now she's like, hey, you know what? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. People want it, and it's giving me publicity. So maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll keep going. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and who that's, knows? that's kind of interesting because ha has this kind of ability to talk to the author and get their intent, has that kind of maybe created some of the problems that we deal now with fandom and things like that? When you think of Star Wars fans, like ripping actresses apart on social media because they don't like it. If they didn't oh, have the problem. access, what's that? What's I was like? Yeah, poor, poor. What's her name? Tran, I think it's Tran, Kelly, name. Kelly Marie Tran. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, I it, it is kind of a little bit of a disconnect, but maybe not really because people, if they feel that the intent of an author is kind of at their fingertips now, if the author themselves is very accessible to them, because you can instead of just you know maybe writing letters and letting time go by between getting them like maybe if you were a you know part of lovecraft's contemporaries or anything to that extent now i can just go on and say dear so and so i'm so angry at you you ruined my life when you made this character a lesbian you know how dare you um you know i mean now all of a sudden everybody's upset and then this thing and now the author's intent is kind of thrown out into the you know in the front and center and That's it can you know it really is and actually especially if there is a controversial topic that comes up uh in in a given story it uh you know now people are really really interested in what the author's intent was is like what did you mean by that or you know or so a lot of times i'm sure people make false accusations of a given author's intent and the author may feel the need to, def to defend him or herself and you know and then I'll, well cat's out of the bag now now we have to talk about that uh <laughs> sam i'm curious did, uh when you were going through your classes did you have to did, did you guys address any of that like the yeah, author ha think, having uh, to so respond to that sort of thing there was i think we so when we were reading oliver twist we talked a lot about a lot of the racial issues that came up. Okay. And I think there was a lot of questions about like author intent and like, you know, was, were these certain stereotypes meant to be in the story, meant to be portrayed in a sort of negative way. And um, we spent a few weeks just talking about, you know, like the response from the author versus like what it actually says in the story. And so I think for the most part, it's really like, it's a really hard thing to do to separate the author from the story, but you also have to consider which what we talked about before that the narrator isn't the author. So of course, some of like what the author personally believes will be in the story, but that does not necessarily mean that every part of the story is their personal belief. Right. I think that's uh, again a hundred percent accurate to say. What was that, anyone? Like Anne was talking about, you know, that's not their necessarily their personal belief because they're writing about it. And uh, yeah. I think uh, I've never been much of a fan of fan fiction. 
So when people, you know, you're talking to people on the internet, they're like, oh, I wrote some fan fiction. You want to read it? I'm like, I'm, I'm not really into that. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, so like people with small children, look, my kid is cute. You want to hold it? No. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why I'd, I'm not a fan of fan fiction. Um, and because it takes a lot of times it takes things that were not necessarily the author's intent or we don't know explicitly. And a lot of it involves romance between characters <laughs> and, and things that happen. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, and things that I was thinking of supernatural. Uh, I just, of course you were. <laughs> I just watched the episode where they, where they go to a convention oh. spoilers and like the supernatural is actually a story in the real world. Cause there's a guy who's a prophet. And they yep. go to the convention, and half the characters are writing fan fiction about the two brothers uh, being in a relationship together. And so I think that's why I'm not part of the reason why I'm not a fan of fan fiction is despite the fact that you don't know everything that's in the author's head and you're not going to write <laughs> as the author, um, it takes away from what the author's intent was. So the yeah. author's intent, like Henry Higgins and My Fair Lady, or Pygmalion, if you're wanting to look at the original, uh, the book, or the or play rather. Um, you know, Henry Higgins is just uh, this bachelor guy. You know, mm -hmm. he, he thinks women are a nuisance. He wants, he's a highly intellectual. Um, and so, like, that's what he wrote. That's what he wanted. But if you take fan fiction, maybe, you know, maybe he's holding out love for some girl that he used to know. Or maybe he has a thing for the other professor. Or, you know, or maybe he really has a thing for the girl. So you don't, you don't really know. And then you, you take it and you turn it and it, it changes the character at least so like if you're trying to get this out to people it changes the character so significantly that i think it is kind of almost violating of the author's intent yeah absolutely you think like you know you're jk rowling and you're sitting there and you're checking out the internet and suddenly instead of snape kills dumbledore it's snape screws dumbledore you know and, <laughs> wait what <laughs> and you know you think about it and you're like what you know i wrote this story Wait, like, what are you they kill doing? Dumbledore? what <laughs> yeah. oh yeah i guess i guess well, spoiler brother. alert for a hundred yeah. years, years ago yeah how long ago was that Man, 20 but, years actually it's 20 years this past oh. week in america oh god i'm so old now but uh <laughs> but yeah that's crazy I, but i'm just saying like if you're an author this is your life you know you've written all these stories and a lot of there's plenty of writers that don't really like fan fiction made from their universe. And I can see why, because Please do not send me your fan art. Do not send me your fan. Yeah. Fiction. Do not read it. Yeah. Fan For fun. one, it's legal because if you do have an idea that happened to be in somebody's fan fiction, they could say, well, you stole my, you know, my work. I got, and, ooh, that's, a, honestly, that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, well, I, uh, JK Rowling stole some things. Uh, there's a and I can't remember the name of the guy, but there's a book and the kid looks just like Harry Potter and has an owl. And so like there are things where she took a lot of stuff. So like that that's another discussion entirely of of plagiarizing <laughs> how far our ideas, uh, you know, original or not. But actually, that's another. That, honestly, that's another uh, fantastic idea for another uh, roundtable discussion that we'll have to do in the future. But we're mm -hmm. actually coming up here in about ninety minutes, so I want to give. <laughs> everybody a chance to uh i'm actually going to do uh this is going to be the first uh, episode where i do something new where i ask the guests the guests for book recommendations and also feel free to uh plug your various social media so uh brian what what's a book that you would recommend and it could be any 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 subject i don't care it could be a, a fiction a book on writing or something else and uh Feel free to tell us where all to find you and your stuff. Why'd you start with me? Um, <laughs> no, um, I guess really, you know, Stephen King's on writing is, is a really great book um, in terms right. of, you know, you might not actually, um, whether you're writing or not, you'll find out a lot about his life. You'll find out a lot about some really funny stories, but you'll also kind of really come to appreciate what sort of things go on in a writer's life behind the scenes, which is something you don't usually get a lot of when you, when you do read something that's kind of trying to help you out with writing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll stick with that. I'll let Sam talk. I feel like she hasn't really had all too much of an opportunity back there. That was totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she has been staying quiet in, in her, uh, in front of her bookshelf over there, which is, which is uncharacteristic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Brian, before I move on, where where can we find the the gray rooms? Uh, so you can you can follow us at, at 
the gray rooms pod you can go to our you can find us on facebook the gray rooms pod you can find us on our website the gray um you can look us up on anything that you use to find uh your podcast on you know itunes it's whatever um and uh we are trying to get an episode like a kind of like our third preseason episode for halloween on you know so uh expect that and then november 30th uh there'll be our first episode for the season it's going to be a bi-weekly podcast so from that point on every two weeks you'll get something uh we'll start off with my story it's called the great war and uh it's it's basically a horror story based in the the trenches of world war one and uh you know the rats are basically the antagonists in the story so if you don't like rats if you, if you don't <laughs> like horror you might want to stay away from it but it's a podcast <laughs> our stories have music in it um sound effects we have professional voice actors you're, you're really going to get a cinematic treat to it if you haven't already listened to some of our preseason ones i think you listen to at least one of them right i haven't yet there. no oh you never listened to falling either okay no no i haven't oh man breaking my heart but yeah it's if they're available <laughs> and um uh yeah just feel free to send us a line sometime we're going to be opening up submissions for season two um probably the beginning of october so if you oh, cool. plan on having any, you know, running any short stories, we'll probably have that open up till uh, March first. Oh, I awesome. think it's going to be October first to March first. Don't don't quote me on that. I haven't actually made any um, official announcements, but I'm thinking that's what we're doing. And, okay, uh, that sounds good. Yeah, sweet. Okay, Aowen, book recommendation and I, where to find you? Uh, can I give more than one book recommendation? You can give. That's acceptable. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. All right. so, uh, <laughs> <He said> maybe. <laughs> a quick fantasy book recommendation by I, I have a couple indie authors. I'll, I'll plug. If it goes too long, I'll just mute you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> quick, uh, quick uh, fantasy recommendation. Uh, R. A. Salvatore, um, mm. his Spearwielder trilogy. The first book is called The Woods Out Back. Uh, I got bogged down with this book too, but it kind of pokes fun at some fantasy tropes and like they mention the Hobbit and they have a character. Uh, that read the Hobbit and he's like, this is not how any of this is. This doesn't happen like this. Trolls don't turn to stone. And so it kind of pokes fun at that. And like, there's an elf, his name is Kelsinel and Elvio, but they call him Kelsey. And so like he, they poke fun at like fantasy trips. So it's kind of fun. Uh, and, and the dragon's name is, is Robert. Uh, so just, just funny things. So for, uh, for some indie stuff, I recently bought book two of Ann Wheeler's uh, books. Ooh. This is Unbroken Fire, sorry. And then Azrian Skies is the book, the first book. Okay. And, uh, I found it because I just, the cover is gorgeous. Like, look, it is. It's beautiful. Um, and so I was like, I want this book on my shelf. Um, so I really enjoyed it. I thought uh, as far as like uh, indie authors published books are concerned, I thought it felt very clean. That's kind of the thing, I like, kind of repetitive, but it's it's very clean. It doesn't, there weren't a lot of editing errors. There was not a lot of like, the back of your brain trying to fix everything um and so and the the story um is about it has a female protagonist who's a pilot and she gets caught up in like intergalactic war and stuff um without giving a lot of spoilers away and then the other one is the star seeker series star seeker oh, this is book okay. one this one actually doesn't look like quite like this anymore um but i don't have the updated version this is book two they're all um they are all alliterated so book one is perdition's pocket um okay. and the series is called star seeker novels of the third colonial war and the um the premise of the story is that there are young midshipmen who are out on a scouting um just just normal scouting trip pre-colonizing um for like setting up for colonization so like they'll set up make sure that there's foundations for buildings and air and all the things are good until everything goes horribly wrong um so it centers around those guys and all the technology is meant to be realistic of so things that are feasible now, or at least in theory. And, but all the aliens are um, animaloids, so they're animalistic. Uh, so they have um, ursoids, they're like bears that walk upright. And, um, but they're kind of in a, a musketeers era. So some people describe it as Narnia meets Firefly, sort of. Mm. Um, and so like they've got pistols and stuff. So you've got like this kind of musketeer society with like the futuristic federation. And there are, huh. I call them gangster li lizards, but they're saurians that are aliens. And there's, 
slavers and all kinds of cool stuff. So it's, it's definitely, I think, unique in, in the genre. Um, I've never heard anything like it, so it's pretty cool. Cool. And uh, where, where, where can people find you and uh, your stuff at? I am on Twitter at Eowyn the Fair, separated out by underscores. And I have a blog about my book stuff. I just posted a big, uh, a big section about one of my, or two of my characters, two of my favorite characters, really. Um, and that is anglorumbooks.wordpress.com. It's A-N-G-L-O-R-U-M. And that's it. Just like it sounds. And like uh, Sam, the last word goes to you. Yes. <laughs> so I've been reading a lot of dystopian and apocalyptic books lately. Um, these are, the first is The Road. Um, oh, great which book. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. Um, the movie is also really great. So I'm rereading this one right now. And then another one, which I feel like not a lot of people talk about is um, Parable of the Sower, which these know. two were like one of the first books that I read that really got me inspired to write dystopian stories. So I'm not going to talk too much about them, but I would definitely suggest picking those up if you really want to read something dystopian or if you want some you know inspiration for writing dystopian stories um and of course you can always read my book variant wars that's on amazon right now and there's also winter neverland if you want to read holiday stories in the middle of the year and uh, uh -huh. you can also catch up with me on twitter at sam baker writes oh we lost brian Oh, no, I'm back. no, I'm no. Back. He, was, I'm he was just uh, flipping out there for a second. Now, Sam, you actually have some some new stuff that you're putting out, don't you? I, I, I'm putting up stories, um, you know, not any real schedule right now, but I'm putting up stories on Wattpad right now. Okay. So, um, you know, if, if anyone's interested in that, I always post links to that on my Twitter when I do post stories. Um, so, yeah, every now and then I'll post a short story. I also have um, a little serial that I'm working on right now for that. Uh, yeah, that was, that was the one I was thinking of. I remember it popping up on, on Twitter. Yeah. And you know what? For those who don't know exactly what Wattpad is, this guy, uh, <laughs> can you can you educate us uh ignorant fools yeah so it's just really it's a platform uh for you to share your stories so um you you know it doesn't cost anything you just post your stories up there it's kind of like a blog but it's really just a site for everyone to find stories and everyone to really share stories so you can read stories on there but you can also post stories so if you're if you want sort of like beta feedback but you don't want to go through the process of getting beta readers just yet that's a good place to do it if you just want to sort of just casually post up stories and get some feedback yeah. from that. Also, fun fact, I, I heard people, somebody asked a question the other day of, because um, I know a lot of publishers don't like it if your book has been already published on Amazon. Um, so somebody was asking about that, um, asking some agents in like pitch wars and stuff, and they said that Wattpad does not negatively impact you. So if you have, if you have your stuff up on Wattpad, um, they're not going to go, oh, your stuff's been published. We don't want that. Yeah. Ah, hmm. Very cool. Now, is there any sort of like copyright protection or something if you put it up on there or well, you, I've heard horror stories. So <laughs> you're you're always like legally owning the copyright of your story, assuming right. it's not like a fan fiction. You mm -hmm. you don't have to actually, you know, go through the copyright process for a story. Right. It just makes it more difficult to prove that it's your story if somebody does like use certain parts of your story in their stories. Mm -hmm. um, but when you go through the process of posting something on Wattpad, it does ask you like, is this, uh, you know, is this your own copyright, like all rights reserved, that kind of thing? Or, you know, is it like public domain? So, you, you know, it's it's something that you don't own the rights to, but you're just it, fan fiction, things like that. So yeah, there is the option to do different things there. Okay, fair, fair enough. So basically, it's yeah, you throw it up there, and you can go after somebody if they steal your stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it might be hard, <laughs> but you can. Yes. Well, okay. Hey, thanks, guys, for uh, coming on. And I don't, I don't know that uh, there's a definitive position on Arthurial Tent. I don't know that there should be. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a fantastic discussion, and thank you for everyone who watched. A special shout out for uh, Billy Owens, and I'm gonna mess up this person's name, and I gotta scroll up a little bit to see it. But J. E. Parazzi, I'm not. I have, don't think I've run into you before, so I have. Okay, good. 
So thanks for coming on. Thanks for commenting over in the chat. And uh, we'll be back in two weeks with uh, something else. <laughs> <laughs> something else something else we'll, we'll we'll be back with something and uh we'll try to let you know but until then uh keep writing keep reading and uh keep the coffee flowing because that's what we live on 